the most important part of having a successful project uh, is to really know what the client is trying to achieve. And if you do know that, you're able to help them better. Hello, and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enix Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for managing and running an architectural practice that lets you do your best work more often. If you haven't already gotten access to our free 60-minute Firmona Masterclass, what are you waiting for? Head on over to smartpracticemethod.com and discover the way to be able to run a practice that actually serves your life if you're a small firm owner. Now, I am overjoyed and happy to have with us today one of our smart practice firm owners with us on the line today. We have Gilbert Attic. Gilbert, welcome to the business of architecture. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Uh, good to have you here. So Gilbert studied architecture at the California Institute of Architecture, Los Angeles, where he received his Master of Architecture degree. He's currently an instructor at the University of Miami School of Architecture. His work engages new media, emerging technologies, materiality, fabrication, producing a multi-platform approach to contemporary design. And he launched his own firm about 18 months ago. Yep. What was behind that, Gilbert? Walk us through this process of going from uh, your previous place of employment and then what prompted you to start your own venture here? Well, I mean, it, it all kind of started out with a childhood fascination with architecture. Um, and throughout my career and pr uh, many offices I worked with, um, all the frustration with how the industry typically works that led us to or led me to leap off uh, the edge to actually open up our own practice. Okay, I'm going to pause you right there. What were some of the frustrations for you about the industry that you remember now? Uh, it's just the constant finger pointing, uh, taking a simple process of building a house or a restaurant build out and just instead of working together as a team with the construction side with the owner uh, and consultants and instead of working together as a team, actually focusing on the negativity, finger pointing uh, and negative aspects of the project. And actually that causes the project to slow down um, and not be completed in a successful manner. And also the clients look at all of us as professionals as not knowing how to do our job. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so common. I mean, we see that so often of just the contractor pointing fingers to the architect or the the owner's rep wondering what the heck's going on. I mean, just in what when you were working in, in that kind of environment, what were the impacts that you were seeing because of that? Well, uh, me and my team uh, basically started to not lose passion, but motivation on the project itself. And like going into, I tried to be like the shield to, that protects my team members uh, so that way I can keep their positive morale um, but going into projects uh, that were had such a negative impact was very draining for us uh, to, to keep that momentum going and, and to try to we were focused on coming up with ways to protect ourselves rather than focusing on ways to uh, take that project into successful completion yeah isn't that yeah. interesting Okay, so those are some of the frustrations that you had in architecture. I'm sure a lot of our listeners can identify with that. And your previous, what was your previous place of employment? Tell me a little bit about the, what you're doing there, your job duties, the company itself. Uh, previously, I worked with a design build firm. I was the director of the architecture uh, department. I, I led a team of architects. Uh, basically, we specially worked on design build projects. And it was more of a contractor led design build firm mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah so you went from cyarc to working for well, you had a did you have any previous employment before you started working for the construction company uh yes i had a couple of uh employments with uh, design architecture firms uh, such as oppenheim uh, gensler uh, tuesday studio which is a local firm um and then you know from those experiences, you know, uh, architecture firms that were highly focused on design solely uh, and not as much as constructability, um, I had a passion to kind of really understand and better uh, get a grasp of how uh, construction works. So that's what led me into uh, construction design build. Uh, and typically right now we actually do construction, but that's uh, architect-led, not contractor-led. Okay. Yeah. In your current firm? 
in my current firm, yes. Got it. Okay. So tell me what, what made you, how, what made you take that leap of faith to go from steady employment? Uh, it's a very comfortable place to be, to getting out there and, and launching your own practice. It's just that constant frustration of wanting to really handle projects a specific way to actually ensure the success of the projects. And there was literally no way to do that without being a firm owner and that actually makes the decisions of how to deal with clients, how, what, when to say yes, when to say no, uh, and and set the stage right from the beginning. Interesting. What were some of your fears and concerns leaving full-time employment going into entrepreneurship? Uh, family. So the biggest, the biggest stressor was, you know, I had at that time I had two kids and a wife and a household that, you know, I was supporting and I had a steady income that was actually a decent income. Uh, it wasn't financial decisions to make a, that leap of faith. Uh, it was more of passion of what I wanted to do. Uh, mm. I was super scared that I would somehow not only fail at it, but fail my family and kids because yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's, you know, I was sending them to good schools. I was trying to provide a life to them to actually better give them better opportunities. Uh, and that's what was my fear to, to be able to, not to be able to provide that. Ooh, yeah, I get a hundred percent. So within, here's the crazy part, which is crazy, but also awesome. You went when you started, so you reached out to us before we had a call before you actually had left that previous place of employment, I think, right. And you kind of let me know how hey, to be leaving my place of employment. We set up a little plan so you could jump into smart practice. You did that. And then you went from, in a matter of four months, you went to, you ramped up to four employees. Correct, yes. We, at that time, I remember I was like meeting with you. I was in a Starbucks. We're looking at our pipeline, which had $5,000 worth of work. Yeah. And I was setting a goal, what I need for myself to sustain, you know, our income. We did the math together and uh, we put targets. And as soon as I created that leap, I realized a lot more work was coming in the door than I anticipated. And uh, that caused us to grow so rapidly to four, which is kind of funny. It goes back to the, like what I was saying, the, the struggle to jump and, and open my own practice. My fear was I will not be able to provide for my family. But as my firm grew, so did the family in a way, because all the employees are people now I have to provide for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And their so it just kind of puts that added pressure and you know to grow within four months to that level uh you know because cash flow issues you know as such a young firm uh to grow that rapidly you would run into some cash flow issues up front right away um, and knowing how to manage that and how to keep everybody paid on time which thank god up to this point uh, I was able to meet every single payroll and 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 provide for the team because now it's such more than just my family. So Gilbert, what was what was the secret? What was your secret to getting so much work uh, right when you started? So uh, we do a lot of restaurant build outs and high end residential projects. So um, what I started doing is calling every single owner's rep that I've worked with in the past uh, ten years. Or, uh, in the South Florida market, uh, calling all the kitchen consultants, engineers that I've worked with, and starting to tell them that I will be going on my own very soon. Uh, and that was welcomed greatly by many, many people. Uh, they really liked working with me and uh, started going out of their way to refer me to future clients. And it was just word of mouth that opened the floodgates per se, uh, just going through all my contacts. Brilliant. Yeah. You, so you had a very specific, so together we set up a little revenue target. We kind of set a little goal for how much revenue you wanted to bring into the practice. And then you basically, you hit the phones, you hit, you hit the phones, just yeah. started making phone calls, right? Which is uncomfortable for a lot of us. Uh, you know, we, we didn't go to design school to try to hit the phones. So how did you get over? Was that the case for you? Or are you the kind of guy that you love being on the phone and calling people up? 
I never thought I would like it. I, I thought that was something, the sales part, I thought I would hate it. Uh, but I, this past year, I've grew to love it. Uh, so I do enjoy having those calls and just one right after the other, I learned from uh, each call and, and tried to improve on it. Beautiful. Uh, what was the switch for you that, that had you go from worried that you were going to hate it to actually loving it? Uh, the switch was basically, I hate to be salesy. Uh, yeah. And, yeah. and throughout the smart practice, you know, the, the whole conversation uh, initially it, it felt like it was going to be salesy, but actually ends up not being that. Um, ends up being trying to really understand your clients and where they're coming from, and 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 that's the most important part of having a successful project uh, is to really know what the client is trying to achieve, and if you do know that, you're able to help them better. Uh, so I just kind of enjoy that process of getting to really know my clients, know what their wants are, uh, and what their struggles are, whether it's a developer. Uh, and they're stretched too thin, and we can give them a process uh, that can alleviate their their pains. Uh, since they're stretched too thin, we can give them a process where we can give them the updates so they don't have to be on all 10 uh, OAC meetings uh, every week. Uh, so trying to find what their pains are and address them. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, so in smart practice, we, we teach and you learned what we call the, the compassionate conversation, which is a consultative process to vet clients and to maximize your fees and to maximize the perceived value, which is the true value of your fees. So what have you, what have you found as, you've, as you progress through smart practice, you've been with us about 18 months now, uh, tell me about the wins for you. What, what have been the big insights, aha, the most valuable parts for you of you know, being part of a program that teaches you how to structure your practice for success? Um, the biggest wins is, uh, as an upcoming, being an employee, you have like a little, a cap financial, like seeing numbers, you see them from the employee side, you think six figures is, wow, that's a big, you know, a, a lot of dollar. I mean, it is a lot of money, but, uh, in terms of like salary. And then once you, you take the leap and, and start looking at it in terms of practice, money becomes like get magnified. So you're, you're getting a lot more money cash flow coming in and out at some points in months, you get six figures coming in and six figures coming out. So it's just, you become, uh, you see, uh, the financial aspect of, uh, the firm much differently from the owner side or the entrepreneur side versus the, the yeah. How so? How do you see it differently? Yeah. Explain that. Uh, the, the, there's no more barrier. You can do if if you set your goals to I want to sell a million dollars this year. There's nothing stopping you. You Beautiful. you just have to do it. Uh, versus on the employee side, you're just kind of limited to what you can do uh, and and growth path. Yeah. Beautiful. So how's it, how's it doing financially for you? Have you surpassed your previous salary at the previous firm, or are you still trying to hit that? Are you keeping the money in the business um, just to grow it? I'm keeping the money in the business just to grow it, but we have surpassed. You know, we, last year we set our a goal of four hundred thousand of sales for first year. We yeah. ended up wow. building for first year. We ended up selling about six hundred and fifty, or in, and some change. Um, and this year uh, we set a goal of a million dollars, and we're we just finished the first quarter uh, and starting the second quarter, and we're we're hitting the sales numbers of about 700k. Yes, so we're, we're yes, on. there you go. Yeah, awesome. All right, so that's the financial side. That's amazing. That's really incredible to go to a million dollar firm within less than two years to be on track to hit that million dollars. Uh, there's a lot of practice owners who run small practices that hover just under that million. They're stuck there for years. And here you are, boom, just, just burning through it. Yep. It's, it's, a uh, it, it's doable. It's easy. It's, it's not, I'm uh, sorry. It's not easy, but it's doable. When you, if mm -hmm. you put your mind to it, you know, you'll be able to 
get it. You know, there's many times I remember trying, like going home and you're almost about to have a breakdown, just driving home with all the stresses, payroll, trying to make sure you you pay everybody on time and co- like having all these uh, accounts receivables that are aging account receivables that you need to collect on. And at some points I used to tell my wife that it feels like I'm running on a bridge that's collapsing, and if I stop, I'll collapse with it. And that gets better over time, you know, as you're able to grasp the, uh, the processes and, and put things in place. The, the emotional roller coaster of running a business gets better. The ups and downs start to, it, they won't go away. I mean, I hope long term, long like they would, but there's still always going to be those ups and downs, but they get, the ups and downs get smaller. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you make it so fun to run a practice. <laughs> we know it's not easy. All right, so tell me about some of the other big wins for you uh, as as you've gone through and been with us here at Business of Architecture. Uh, in terms of clients, we're able to lock in, you know, um, a few uh, large repeat clients, uh, developers that do a lot of uh, restaurants. Uh, so that, that has been very uh, that that has been one of our goals, um, and we're able to you know lock in a few repeat clients. Uh, my fear was starting a practice in this economy. You could get work, uh, but trying to lock in repeat clients what was one of my goals, and we're we're we're, we're able to lock in two of uh, big clients that that provide us repeat work, and that can give us stability. Um, that's beautiful so tell me how has how have the things that you've learned in smart practice how has it rolled over to every other area of life uh, for one the compassionate conversation uh, the one that we use to kind of get to know our clients better uh, that can be applied in all aspects uh, from your personal life uh, trying to really have when you have communications with your spouse trying to understand where they're coming from what they're how they perceive how they see things uh, to even employees talking to your staff from their perspective uh, trying to really listen uh, and uh, you know understand where they're coming from uh, even to interviewing new potential uh, uh, candidates to work with us uh, i had one one uh, one interviewee told me that I've never had somebody really ask me these types of questions and want to understand me uh, mm. like this and actually, uh, really listening to what we're saying instead of being on their phone during this conversation. Mm. Mm. So hiring, talk to me about uh, working with people, working with employees and what you've, what you've learned about that as you've built your practice. One of the first things I realized, well, uh, not every, everyone is not the same and they will not have the same drive or motivation that I would have because each person is different and unique and they have different motivations. Um, one of the struggles is trying to figure out what their motivations are and how to connect with them. So that, that's, that's where, that's the, one of the first things that as a business owner, you have to realize. Uh, try to understand your staff, what motivates them, what makes them tick, so that way you can actually provide them the right tools. Uh, and each person does things differently. So you try to manage that uh, and communicates differently too. So trying to manage that communication process was difficult. Mm-hmm. What have you found to be some of the challenges of working with team members, especially uh, younger team members or less experienced team members, what have been some of the challenges that, that have plagued you as as an owner? Uh, the biggest challenge is now we're, we're in a different time post-COVID. Um, the, the, work, uh, the work ethic has changed a little bit in terms of there's more of a, a focus on personal life, and that's very important to, to maintain. Uh, but the challenge there is the market is still stuck in clients are still stuck pre 
COVID mentality mm. yeah. while, you know, companies are trying to make that shift uh, to have the better balance for their staff, uh, higher mm-hmm. pay, uh, trying to balance those out. Um, you know, once you have bring in the work-life balance, that means deadlines are going to take a little bit longer. And if deadlines mm-hmm. take a little bit longer, that means payroll is going to run longer and mm-hmm. it's going to hit the jobs more. And either, you know, clients have to start paying a little bit more of a premium for longer <laughs> deliverables uh, to really uh, adjust for inflation and for a better work-life balance for staff. Yep. Beautiful. So how do you manage, what's your, what's your philosophy on managing that? Being able to still get the work done while maintaining a respect for the balance and work-life balance and things outside of, outside of work. Uh, we have implemented like a weekly uh, action list meeting uh, that we go through every single project as a team. Um, I, I like to give my staff uh, the opportunity to give me their deadlines. So I, present the you know we have this deadline coming up uh or this task to be uh, coming up that needs to be completed when can you finish it by Mm -hmm. that's smart yeah monday or this tuesday i try to give myself a little bit of a barrier uh and uh you know if i tell the client it'll be done by wednesday or or thursday to allow us to have quality control on the product trying to hold that, you know, sometimes clients push back uh, and trying to hold that firmly to, you know, and uh, so far, every time a client has pushed back, we've been able to hold our grounds on a deadline because we really need the time to do, a, a, you know, we tell them, you, you rather spend the extra week in design than an extra month in construction because we didn't yeah. think it out right. Yeah. Yeah. That, uh, that's a, I'm glad you brought up that strategy of having your employees tell you when they can get it done. This is something I learned years and years ago, probably 15 years ago. Uh, the company I was working with is a development company, and the guy who ran it was a, a graduate of the Naval Academy. He was like this big, burly Italian guy. He looked like he, he could have been off the movie The Godfather or something. You know, he's like this pretty intense guy. And, um, you know, he'd be the kind of guy that sometimes he would throw things in meetings or punch holes in walls. Like he was a pretty intense fellow, very successful. Um, uh, but his leadership style, when he wasn't yelling or punching holes in walls, you know, he would he would ask, hey, when do you think you can get this done? And he would just completely put it on you. You told him. Uh, but then if you didn't meet that deadline, well, then then he's, he's going to hold you to account, you know. Yeah. And that's kind of cool. You like give him, I, I call that give him, giving him their own rope to hang him. <laughs> yep. Correct. Yeah, and it's 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 uh, the hardest part is the accountability. Trying to hold people accountable to to meet timelines, uh, whether it goes into your staff, uh, and also I've been doing that approach with engineers too, uh, because our consultants we're, we're it's a much bigger team, and I always try to do that. Uh, I, before I used to be telling, like I used to say, okay, you have two weeks to finish this, and I force them into that timeline, and ends up being the same whatever the three weeks that they originally asked for. So yeah. to avoid yeah. all that frustration, yep. might as well let them, you know, pick that timeline and, and we'll, we'll just have to make it. Beautiful. Gilbert, what are you excited about now? What's next for a Teak architecture? Where's, where's the vision? Where, where, what are you really creating here for yourself? Uh, basically, uh, well, what we're excited about is, tr- is really, uh, Complete like we're do we do our uh, design build so we're trying to really streamline that process for our uh, clients and really focus on the constructability uh, aspect of our work uh, so the client gets the seamless process from hiring the architect all the way to construction so our, our goal is right now is to focus more on the construction side. Uh, mm try to merge that together with the architecture so that way uh, we can provide that seamless uh, seamless uh, process that led us to actually open up our own practice mm. to avoid, mm. avoid that whole, uh, back and forth bickering for no reason beautiful beautiful all right 
And what do you find in terms of the design build? How do you structure the team? Do you have in-house contractors? Uh, do you have? Do you just hire a construction supervisor on an ad hoc basis to run all the subs? What's what does that look like for you? Uh, we have in-house contractors, uh, mm-hmm. and we basically for we have you know architecture uh, process is broken down into schematic design, design development, construction documents. We try to do a lot of check-ins in between uh, yep. to ensure that we're on track with constructability, with budgets. Like, for example, we had a client reach out to us. Uh, she had a shopping center. Uh, she, she had a design for it. The budget came in at $3 million, uh, and she only has $1.7 million to spend on the restoration of the space. So she reached out and says, I need to shave off. Or half the price. Uh, yeah, that sounds like architect. fun. Yeah, <laughs> and unfortunately, her previous architect passed away. So she's like, I'll "Oh wow, give you the architecture, and then I want you guys to build it as well for us." Uh, well, we hit the ground running prior to taking the job. We did a feasibility study with her to see if we could hit that target. And our process is: we met with subs. We we spend like a couple of days ensuring that we can actually commit to that uh, target. We, we uh, met with subs, all the consultants. We really broke it down even to like uh, people are going to be doing the shop drawings for uh, the metal components, priced it out, and we found out that we can actually hit that target for her. Wow. And then we committed to the job uh, that she, you know, initially she ended up paying for that consultancy. Yeah. Um, and then she hired us for the project and we're actually able to save her the 1.5 million to get her back on 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 budget and give her a product that uh while it's not identical to her previous designs but something that she actually loves beautiful beautiful very cool well Gilbert, what what question have i not asked you that you think i should have asked you um uh, I can't think of anything right now. <laughs> okay, I did a pretty good job. We're good. Yep. Well, Gilbert, thanks. Yeah, thanks for coming on here, man. You're rocking it. Uh, you know, hopefully this interview inspires all the other small practice owners out there to recognize that they don't need to continue to deal with an inadequate pipeline, that it is possible to quickly grow and scale your practice, that it doesn't mean that you need to work nights and weekends all the time, although I'm sure you've done that a bit because you are starting a business. So, Gilbert been great having you here on the business of architecture thank you for having us and that's a wrap oh yeah one more thing if you haven't already head on over to itunes and leave a review we'd love to read your name out here on the show this episode is sponsored by smart practice the world's leading step-by-step business training program that's helped more than 103 architecture firm owners structure their existing practice so the complexity of business doesn't get in the way of their architecture. Because you see, it's not your architecture or design skills that's holding you back. It's the complexity of running a business, managing projects and people, dealing with clients, contractors, and money. So if you're ready to simplify the running of your practice, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash smart to discover the proven, simple, and easy to implement smart practice method for running a practice that doesn't get in the way of doing exceptional architecture. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.